Good evening and welcome to our Wednesday evening service tonight. We make our beginning in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let my prayer rise before you as incense, the lifting up of my hands as the evening sacrifice. Joyous light of glory, of the immortal Father, heavenly, holy, blessed Jesus Christ, we have come to the setting of the sun, and we look to the evening light. We sing to God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. You are worthy of being praised with pure voices forever. O Son of God, O giver of life, the universe proclaims your glory. Our reading this evening is from Judges chapter 6. The people of Israel did what was evil in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord gave them into the hand of Midian seven years. And the hand of Midian overpowered Israel, and because of Midian the people of Israel made for themselves the dens that are in the mountains and the caves and the strongholds. For whenever the Israelites planted crops, the Midianites and the Amalekites and the people of the east would come up against them. They would encamp against them and devour the produce of the land as far as Gaza and leave no sustenance in Israel and no sheep or ox or donkey. For they would come up with their livestock and their tents. They would come like locusts in number. Both they and their camels could not be counted. So that they laid waste the land as they came in. And Israel was brought very low because of Midian. And the people of Israel cried out for help to the Lord. When the people of Israel cried out to the Lord on account of the Midianites, the Lord sent a prophet to the people of Israel. And he said to them, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, I led you up from Egypt and brought you out of the house of bondage. And I delivered you from the hand of the Egyptians and from the hand of all who oppressed you and drove them out before you and gave you their land. And I said to you, I am the Lord your God. You shall not fear the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell, but you have not obeyed my voice. Now the angel of the Lord came and sat under the terebinth at Ophrah, which belonged to Joash the Abrazite. While his son Gideon was beating out wheat in the winepress to hide it from the Midianites. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him and said to him, The Lord is with you, O mighty man of valor. And Gideon said to him, Please, sir, if the Lord is with us, why then has all this happened to us? And where are all his wonderful deeds that our fathers recounted to us, saying, Did not the Lord bring us up from Egypt? But now the Lord has forsaken us and given us into the hand of Midian. And the Lord turned to him and said, go in, this, go in this might of yours, and save Israel from the hand of Midian. Do not I send you? And he said to him, Please, Lord, how can I save Israel? Behold, my clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I am the least in my father's house. And the Lord said to him, But I will be with you, and you shall strike the Midianites, as one man. And he said to him, If now I have found favor in your eyes, then show me a sign that it is you who speaks with me. Please do not depart from here until I come to you and bring out my present and set it before you. And he said, I will stay till you return. So Gideon went to his house and prepared a young goat and unleavened cakes from an ephra of flour. The meat he put in a basket, and the broth he put in a pot, and brought them to him under the terebinth, and presented them. And the angel of God said to him, Take the meat and the unleavened cakes, and put them on this rock, and pour the broth over them. And he did so. Then the angel of the Lord reached out the tip of the staff that was in his hand, and touched the meat and the unleavened cakes, and the fire sprang up from the rock, and consumed the flesh and the unleavened cakes. And the angel of the Lord vanished from his sight. Then Gideon perceived that he was the angel of the Lord. And Gideon said, Alas, O Lord God, for now I have seen the angel of the Lord face to face. But the Lord said to him, Peace be to you. Do not fear. You shall not die. Then Gideon built an altar there to the Lord and called it, The Lord is Peace. To this day it still stands at Ophrah, which belongs to the Abrazites. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We continue with our hymn.
with us every night In your arms we find our healing You defend us in the fight Through the past and in the present You are with us every day King of kings until forever Lord, to you our voices raise Grace and peace be entered from God, our Father, and His Son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. As we begin a new ser sermon series this Wednesday evening, I thought back to our sermon last week on don't worry, be happy, and how we worry. And I thought of another Old Testament figure who was also a worrier, but God made a warrior. So for the next three or four weeks, we're going to look at the book of Judges as we look at the life of Gideon. Now, most of us have watched Superman or read the Superman comic books. And if you look at Superman from the eyes of Lois Lane as Clark Kent, the fumbling, bumbling, timid reporter, at the Daily Planet newspaper, what you see is a worrier. Somebody that's too wimpy for her taste. But we also know that Clark Kent was not just that reporter, but he was also Superman. That man of steel, who was Lois Lane's idea of a warrior, who she fell in love with, not knowing that he was also Clark 
Kent, the fumbling, bumbling reporter. This loser, she saw, was in fact a leader. Had Superman comics been around the time of Gideon, some 3,150 years ago, this Hebrew man, Gideon, would have identified with both Clark Kent and Superman. Now, it's not that Gideon flew around Israel in tights, but he did win some spectacular victories over the enemy of God's people. In fact, God even calls him a mighty warrior. But as we begin to look at Gideon, we also see that there was this Clark Kent side to him. He was a huge warrior. So as we begin this sermon series of Gideon, today we're going to learn about Gideon's gig and how Gideon, a loser in the eyes of people, became a great leader. As we look at the book of Judges, the six chapters, Harlan just read it. The time period of which this is coming from was not a peaceful one for the nation of Israel because they had quit listening to God and God had allowed the Midianites, a nomadic group of people who made a regular, hap a regular habit of raiding Israel to come in and really they took Israel and tested them to their limits. Okay. The Midianites were so great in number that when they invaded, it was almost like a bunch of grasshoppers covering the land. As they'd come riding in on their camels, it would just darken the area because there was so many of them. And there was nothing the Israelites could do about this but take to the hills and hide. Hide in the caves until those terrible Midianites would go back home again only to come back again and raid a little later on. For seven years this was going on. Seven years the Israelites put up with the Midianites coming in and raiding their homes and the Israelites would have to go up into the caves and hide and then the Midianites would leave and they would come back out and continue their life then the Midianites would come back. Seven years this goes on before they finally decide maybe they should call on God for some help. Now, why did it take seven years for the Israelites to call for help? Well, it's kind of like a male when he's driving down the road taking a wrong turn and he takes seven wrong turns before he goes and asks for directions. Why? Because of pride. Israelites were very prideful people. They thought they could do this on their own, so they weren't going to call on God for help. Instead, they were going to take care of their own problem. But after seven years, they figure out, oh, maybe God needs to come in and take care of things. And so they cry to God. And God hears their cry for help. But the interesting thing is, when they he, God hears their cry for help, he doesn't send a savior to them to fix all the problems, but instead he gives them a sermon. You see, our reading says, A prophet came from the people and proclaimed, This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. I brought you up out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. I snatched you from the power of Egypt and from the hand of all your oppressors, I drove them before you and gave you their land. I said to you, I am the Lord your God. Do not worship the God of the Amorites in whose land you live, but you have not listened to me. The Israelites got a sermon from God that was all law, showing them exactly why this was going on, because they hadn't listened to God. Now, we don't know what was going on in the minds of the Israelites, but then again, the angels must find it equally hard to understand why were they blaming God? Or even, why do we blame God? 
why when things go bad in our life, and one of the first things we do is blame God, question God, wonder if God is going to help us, or if he is just going to sit idly by and let us suffer. Now, we all know that it's because of our sins of selfishness that contribute to the difficulties, and yet we have the gall to suggest that it's God's fault for letting these things happen. We love to blame God for how bored we are with life. And then we use that for an excuse to how we spend our free time in our own sinful pursuits. Even when life gets difficult as a result of our sins, it is difficult for us to turn to God for help. This help which he offers us in his word. Instead, what do we do but be like the Israelites were at this time and try to fix things on our own. Now we're going to see for the Israelites in Gideon's day, that that didn't work out too well. Did they they spend a considerable time in the dark, wet caves, thinking that this was the only way they could find safety from the Midianites? After all that God had given them as he gave them this promised land, how could they forget this? But forget it, is what the Israelites did. So God sent that sermon to them instead of the Savior. You know, oftentimes we think that's pretty typical of God. Because we picture God at times as this nagging, I told you so parent that is going to prove us wrong and then tell us exactly why we were wrong because we didn't listen to them. But when God told them so, it was because the Israelites needed to be confronted with their sins and then led to repentance for them. Because only after the confrontation that God has with them, after he shows them their sins, then they can appreciate what he was about to do for them. And what did God do? God sends an angel of the Lord. Now, oftentimes when we see the angel of the Lord being sent in the Old Testament, it's used for the Son of God. And oftentimes we see that as the pre-incarnate Christ. And this angel of the Lord went from north central Israel not far from Nazareth, and he plunks himself down under an oak tree, and he begins to watch a man named Gideon separate wheat kernels from their husks. And the angel of the Lord says to Gideon, The Lord is with you, mighty warrior. Now, that was too much for Gideon. Just his greeting was too much for Gideon. Because Gideon blurts out, but serve the Lord is with us. Why is this happening to us? Where are all of his wonders that our fathers told us about when they said, did not the Lord bring us up out of Egypt? But now the Lord has abandoned us. The Lord has turned us over to the people of Midian. Now evidently when God preached that sermon to the Israelites, Gideon was one of them sleeping in the pews because he certainly didn't hear the message God sent to them. Because as far as Gideon was concerned, Israel's troubles were God's fault. I mean, how would you have responded? The angel of the Lord could have struck Gideon dead He could have left. He could have even rebuked Gideon with more of God's law. But he didn't do that. The angel of the Lord tells Gideon a word of grace. Go in strength you have and save Israel out of Midian's hand. Am I not sending you? 
You see, when Gideon complains to the angel that God isn't with him, what does the angel do? He doesn't rebuke him. He doesn't give him a sermon full of law this time. No. He commissions him to go. As he tells him, go, I am sending you. Now it makes you wonder if the angel understood. He's standing here talking to a man that is threshing grain in a simple wine press, because that's all he had. Here was a man who was seen by everybody as an unlikely scaredy cat who hides his lunch money from the playground bully. And even Gideon thought that the angel of the Lord had the wrong man. As I'm sure in a squeaky, whiny little voice, he said, But Lord, how can I save Israel? My clan is the weakest in Manasseh. I am the least in my family. Now wait a minute. When we look back at the Old Testament, we see this going on a lot. The angel of the Lord comes to somebody and says, God is sending you, and how do they respond? (laughs) God can't send me. And they come up with excuses. Especially, we see this with Moses. As God calls to him from the burning bush, what did Moses say? Oh, I am too young. Oh, I can't speak well enough. Oh, I can't. I can't go. You see, Moses too thought God had the wrong guy. But God made it clear to Moses, just as he makes it clear to Gideon, and as he makes it clear to us, that it's not what you know, but it is who you know. God says to Gideon, I will be with you, and you will strike down all of the Midianites together. What's God saying is literally one man, Gideon, is going to strike down this great army that keeps marauding the Israelites. So how is Gideon going to be certain of this? If only he could have a sign that this stranger was really sent from God. So Gideon asked the stranger to remain while he cooked him up a banquet. And the angel of the Lord agreed and waits while Gideon needs the flour for 20 loaves of bread. He slaughters a goat. He prepares the meat. He boils up the soup. Now, this wasn't McDonald's. okay? And I know oftentimes McDonald's isn't that fast anymore, but it's still considered fast food. Where in usually less than five minutes, we have ordered, we've paid, we have our food, and we're eating. Okay? This isn't what's going on with Gideon. He needs the flour. It's got to rise. He makes 20 loaves of bread. He has to go slaughter that goat. He has to skin it. He has to cut it up. He has to prepare the meat. He makes the soup. And the whole time, the angel of the Lord sits there patiently. Now, that in itself is a response of grace. It's a response of grace because, you know, the angel of the Lord, he didn't need that offering. He didn't have to wait around, but he did. He did it to let Gideon show his love for him. Kind of like as some days we are getting ready to walk out the door and somebody hollers, just wait a second, I have something for you. And we stop and we patiently wait until they can give us this item. Now, and also, it's not like the angel of the Lord, our God in heaven, isn't omnipresent. So it's not like he didn't have all the time in the world for each of us. So he waited, and he waited for Gideon to prepare the meal. And when Gideon had finished his preparation, the angel of the Lord tells him to put the food on the rock where he touched it, where he has him touch it with his staff, and instantly a fire consumes everything. And when that fire consumes everything, the angel of the Lord disappears. And Gideon 
cries out, I have seen the angel of the Lord face to face. And he also knew that nobody looked to the face of God and could live, so he knew he is going to die. But what does God say to Gideon? Do not be afraid. You're not going to die. Peace be with you. Gideon was so struck by the answer that what he does is he builds an altar right there and he names it, The Lord is Peace. Gideon had asked for a sign and there he got it. And that sign was a sign of peace. But oftentimes we look for that same sign from God. We look for a sign of peace. We look for a sign of comfort. We look for a sign of hope. And honestly, it's right there for us. All we have to do is look at the cross. Because on that altar, God sacrificed His Son to pay for our sins. That cross, which means agony, that cross, which means death, that cross, which meant hell, means peace. It means joy. And it means eternal life for us. We didn't need a dazzling display of glory to convince us of God's love. In fact, that display would only frighten us as it did for the disciples when they saw Jesus transfigured before him. But there at the cross, we're assured that everything is right between God and us. And that cross is also God's solemn seal that he promises certain things to us. And those promises can be trusted. So what happened to Gideon? How does that warrior become a warrior? Well, you'll have to take part in our service next week to find out. But one thing you don't have to wait until then to know is there's no reason for us to be warriors. We have constantly been reminded that we have a God who listens to us and hears our cries for help. And how does he answer them? Through the promises he gave us in Scripture. But God sends us more than a sermon. He sent us that Savior in the person of Jesus. Jesus, the angel of the Lord, who says to us, be at peace. I died for you. I now live for you. You. So we are at peace as warriors for God because our Lord is indeed with us. Amen. Let us pray together the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Lord Jesus, stay with us, for the evening is at hand, and the day is past. Be our constant companion on the way. Kindle our hearts, and awaken hope among us, that we may recognize you, as you are revealed in the scriptures and in the breaking of the bread. Grant this for your name's sake. Amen. And let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God.